Jesús. Santa María, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis pecatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. I've been reading a book, and uh, it's called The Hidden Stream, and by Ronald Knox. I recommend it. It's really cool. And... Uh, so he's an apologetic, so he really describes and explains the faith. Today in the scripture, we have uh, about, we talk about love and also about the church. And Ronald Knox talks about this, how the church is both visible and invisible. And we would say that love is also invisible and visible. Love, the poets write about it, right? I remember when I was a young man, uh, I think I've confessed it since then, but I saw a movie called How to Be a Player. And basically, you know, how to have many different girlfriends at the same time. And so what, it would be, the idea of that movie is you tell all of them you love them, you're the best. What makes, why do you love me? You're different, right? And so each one, you're words, right? But love, you see, isn't just words. And it isn't just this imaginary abstract reality. It has to be grounded in reality. It has to prove true. It has to be concrete. It has to be expressed in the concrete. So it is both in invisible, you know, as we saw in one movie, it all begins here, right? And it also has to be concrete, expressed. And, and someone might even have a good intention and have a lot of love in their heart. But if you do not express it, then it's not received by the other person. And so also the church, and this is where I get back to Ronald Knox, it's both visible and invisible. It's not just a bunch of people that we love Jesus. I love Jesus. So that makes me a part of the church. And, then, and you know, I was just listening also to Luis Toro, and uh, one of the Protestants, he cites Romans 12, verse 5, where it talks about, you know, all, the, all of us who are gathered here together, you know, that makes up the body of Christ. But the truth is that the church is not just this invisible reality that just we say we love Jesus. Because in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus will come and say, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. And we have Jesus here who says, love me. But then he says, fulfill my commandments. And so Ronald Knox about the church, he gives a really cool little image just to kind of ground this. He says that Jesus, when he refers to the kingdom of God, when he refers to the church, he says it's what? It's like a net that you gather in good fish and bad fish. And then you also like when you like a field that has good wheat and bad wheat. So the net, the church of God has sinners in it, and we're all sinners, but it has those who are, who are not living their faith, not practicing their faith, and those who are practicing their faith. But there's this visible structure that brings them all together. There's this visible structure. If it were so that it's just this invisible reality, as they say, all you had to say is, my name, I love Jesus then that would eradicate Jesus' example of the church, which includes people who are wheat, which includes those fish that will be in the end of time taken out. So it is like a net. It is like a field. And then in, I think, Father Luis Toro, when we listen to uh, uh, about ecumenism, when he talk about Ephesians 4, is he says, one, there is one body, there is one spirit, so both corporal, visible structure and invisible structure. I mean, invisible reality. So those who believe, but we believe somewhere. And I think that we see that, you know, uh, today in Acts of the Apostles, we're in Acts of the Apostles, and uh, we hear that this double reality, you know, St. John Paul II what, what chapter are we on in Acts again? 15. 15, 15. So in Acts chapter 15, verse 7 and, and following, we have what John Paul II pronounced on the Vigil of Pentecost. And he's preaching about the Holy Spirit. And he says that the hierarchical aspect and structure of the church and the charismatic 
aspect of the church are co-essential. And I was reading also in Renew Your Wonders by uh, Damien Stain that St. Thomas Aquinas speaks about miracles and how they too are necessary to confirm the faith. And so here we have the hierarchical structure. Here we have St. Peter. They're talking, they're discussing some among them who are Christians, some among them who say we believe in Jesus say this very thing. Um, sister, can you come up here and bring us out of the darkness and into the light by proclaiming to us what, you know, these guys come together from Judea and were teaching the brethren. They were teaching this. This wasn't just a personal thing. They were teaching. What were they teaching? Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. So here we have Christians preaching what is not the truth completely, right? That if you are not circumcised, you shall not be saved. And so what happens? We see here the hierarchical structure of the church. We see here authority, as we saw in Matthew 16, that Jesus gives to Peter, I give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I want to get to heaven. And Jesus said, by the way, the keys are here. I want to take the car. The keys are over there. Okay. So I have to go where the keys are. And Jesus says, I give the keys to Peter. Peter has the keys. And so he's the one that you want to get to heaven. You go to him. He's got the keys. He can open the door for you. And it, Jesus gives to Peter the keys to the kingdom. He gives whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And so here we have a confusion. I'm a good Christian. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead me to all truth. So it must be true that unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. Because the Holy Spirit was the one that told me when I was praying. But here we see that that is not enough. We need the church. We need Peter. Jesus is not an idiot, right? Nor does he do anything that has no real purpose. Nor does he say one single word without purpose. I might do that. But Jesus, every word he says. And so there is a need for Peter. A need for the church. A need for a hierarchy. Jesus wasn't just, you know, while we're here sitting around, let me just give you the keys. There's something true. There's something necessary. Because this will happen nowadays. People will say, brothers and sisters, you cannot baptize infants. It is against scripture, right? And I, and, and, and I was just listening to a debate, you know, by P, John, what's his name? Luis Toro and this other Protestant guy. And, I, you know, he's like, you know, the church, I'll tell you what the church is. The church is those who believe in Jesus. And those who believe in purgatory are not part of the church. The word of God says that those who believe that the purgatory is part, that's not the church. <laughs> and so Luis told us, like, well, can you give me one scripture where it says, we'll believe you. If you show us one little scripture that says, by the way, if you believe in purgatory, you are not part of the church of Christ. But this man, what he says, he says it to, he's saying he believes it, but he's saying it. And without grounding it in authority, without grounding it in truth. And so Luis Toro says, we don't want to hear your words. We want to hear the word. So if you can please back up what you're saying in the scripture. And so here, uh, so it's not just what you go around preaching. It's not just the Holy Spirit told me. It is that Peter clarifies for us. Peter, the authority of the church, the authority, and all good things come from the Father, says Ephesians, right? And so the authority of the church to clarify, and these Jews are good people. These Jews become Christians. They're good. They're really nice people, right? And they're here at our meeting together with us. And Peter stands, and uh, sister, what happens here? Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so being sent... Uh, right, right, seven, right? Okay, verse seven, what happens? And after there had been much debate, Peter rose and said to them. After there had been much debate, Peter rises and Peter says. 
And so once he finishes explaining, you know, that the Holy Spirit has come upon the Gentiles just like on us, uh, you know that I preached to the Gentiles and that the Holy Spirit came upon them. And, and, and here we see now the charismatic dimension. We saw that the Holy Spirit came upon them. How? Not just because they could recite, I believe in one God but because they began to proclaim the marvels of the church of the, of God they began to talk, speak in tongues the holy spirit was manifest and so he says we saw the holy spirit we saw the holy spirit come upon them just as it did upon us and it purified their hearts just as it purified our hearts so let us not put a burden on them that we haven't been able to carry this whole time you know we've been Jews and you read Galatians and it says that the old covenant, the old commandments, were those that he brought us to death. And now the new covenant is what brings us to life. And so Saint, so Peter is saying this, that we were unable to carry. Are we going to put it now on them? No. And so Peter has spoken. And then what happens in verse 12, just that first little part, verse 12. And all the assembly kept silence. And all the assembly kept silence. And then they hear Paul and Barnabas. What do they talk about? Can you say what they talk about? Here we're going to see the charismatic dimension. As they related what signs and wonders mm -hmm. yes, yes. God had done through them among the Gentiles. So they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what? Signs and wonders. Signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So here we see St. Aquinas coming true. The miracle confirms the faith. The hierarchical and the charismatic, right, together. And here we have them both coming forth, both necessary. You know, as Jim said to us, a fire is awesome. And a fireplace without a fire is no fireplace at all. But also, a fire in your kitchen is no good. You want the fire in the fireplace. So we need the hierarchical structure, and we need the fire. And we need the Holy Spirit, the charismatic dimension. And the same is true of love. The same is true of Jesus. And, and I love this. Like He's preaching to us that we must abide. Where, was, where, was, where sister, must we be? Where is our home? Can you please tell us? In verse 9. So John 15 verse 9. This is our home. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. As the Father. I feel like this scripture, if we could just somehow wrap it around us. If we could somehow make a some sort of cloak. Just wrap us around in this scripture. And repeat this scripture over and over again. Can you hear the truth of these words? Can you hear the consolation of these words? Can you hear the power of these words? For he says, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Whoa, whoa. You know, and, um, you know, I, I told, you know, when I was in high school and had girlfriends, I told them they were the greatest. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. But these words are for everyone and are true and are proven by blood and by a life. And so, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And then it says, where must we abide? Abide in my love. Abide in my love. Let us remain there. He's giving us the instruction to abide in there, to remain there. And then, but what, let's say, is this just a bunch of abstractness? I love. Do you love? I love. We're all love. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, is this just an invisible reality? Or is this a visible reality as well? If you read verse 10, the very next verse, he just told us we loved us. We're just full of love right now. And then what does he say to us? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, it is necessary for you to keep my commandments, for you to abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments 
and abide in his love. And so he says, I love you, abide in this love, but if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. So it's grounded in reality. And Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus comes up on the mount. You know, he's the new Moses. When they prophesied that Moses prophesied in somewhere in Deuteronomy, I forget the verse, maybe it's 19. 18, 18, 18. Deuteronomy 18, 12. In Deuteronomy 18, 12, Moses says, a prophet like myself shall come. And Jesus goes up on the mount and he gives the sermon on the mount. Right. And he gives the new commandment. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So this is not just an interpretation of the law. This is he is taking what was said and now he's giving you the real law. He's going deeper beyond. And as St. Paul says in Galatians, right in Galatians five, he says the law is fulfilled in, will, in love. But Matthew five through seven isn't just. My, imagine six, five, six, seven, three chapters. And it's not just Jesus saying, hey, I love you. And go tell everybody else you love them too. No, he has given you real, concrete ways. He's saying, if you say to anybody Gehenna, you're liable. I mean, if you say to anybody, uh, idiot, you fool, you're liable. If you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. And he goes and he gives us the commandments, his commandments and so love is grounded but the joy and this i finish here is that uh if we fulfill the commandments if we choose love then what will happen why does jesus tell us these things why these things i have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full that my joy and what must be the joy of the son because he says that my joy that my joy be in you, and that your joy may be full. And this is why. So, brothers and sisters, the church is both visible and invisible. It's visible and love as well. And so, blessed be his name. Amen. 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 Amen.